Welcome to the Purview Center Workshop, Teaching Online with Candice and Zoom. I'm Jenny Frederick, Executive Director of the Purview Center for Teaching and Learning. Here, my colleagues Brian Pauze and Timberly Barbara Marini will lead the workshop. Our center will continue to offer academic continuity support for Yale faculty and teaching fellows as we practice social distancing. Visit academiccontinuity.yale.edu for more information and resources. We'll continue to add new resources in the form of videos, PDF guides, and web pages. So check back often. We're here to help. All right. Hello, everyone. I think we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, thank you so much for being here. I am Timberly Barbara Marini, and I work here at the Porvoo Center supporting Canvas. And, uh, and um, I'm Brian Pauze, and I also work here at the Porvoo Center um, and in this capacity supporting Zoom. And um, today we're just going to jump into um, some of the key things that uh, you may want to know about using Canvas and Zoom with your class now. Um, before we get too far involved in this, I do want to kind of do a, a little um, like public service announcement in that um, Canvas is a CAS authenticated system. So you are you do need to log in with your NetID and password. And if you are not on campus, you will need to use multi-factor authentication in order to log into Canvas. Um, so if you have not already done so, you will want to get multi-factor authentication using Duo set up on your devices so that you will be able to log in. Um, similarly, Canvas and Zoom are not, they do not require this, but some systems that you use in the course of your class and your business, you may need to have uh, the VPN accessibility in order to, um, you may have to use VPN in order to access some of this, those systems. So you'll want to get that set up as well. Um, again, that is not for Canvas, that is not for Zoom, but you may want to set up VPN and have that ready to go just in case you do use a system that does require that. So those are two things that you can contact the ITS help desk to get set up. Um, and I definitely recommend that you do that before you go off campus. Um, so jumping into Canvas now, um, one of the things that's gonna be super important for you is to remember that you need to communicate frequently with your students to let them know about what you're doing for your class and how you're going to be managing your class and your expectations for their participation in your class. And Canvas does provide a couple of tools that are great for communicating with your students. Um, and those two tools are the inbox tool and the announcements tool. Now, both of these tools, when you use them within Canvas, it will trigger an email notification to the student's Yale email address. Um, so that is the default setting is it will send those messages, but I do recommend that you just let your students know what tools you are using to communicate with them so that they know where to find information that you're providing for them about how class is going or what, what, they're, what they need to be doing. Um, for those two tools, I do recommend that you as instructors kind of check on and possibly modify your own personal notifications so that you can receive copies of things that you're sending out because the default is that you do not receive these. So just I recommend that you go into Canvas, you log in, and in the left side global navigation bar, there is a button for account. It's the um, topmost button. And when you click on account, it's going to pop out this little drawer thing. And then you can click on notifications. And once you get to this page, you will see that there is a whole list of things that can trigger email notifications to your Yale email account. Um, under the course activities area, you will see that there are two separate um, preferences for announcements. The first one, which is just called announcement, is whether or not you want to receive an email notification when someone else posts an announcement in a course that you're enrolled in. The second option is announcements created by you, and that is um, determining whether or not you want to receive a notification for announcements that you create. The default setting for announcements created by you is to be turned off. That's what that little X is. And we recommend that you change that over to the check mark, which means send it to me immediately. 
And just to kind of go over what these little icons mean, the check mark means please send a notification immediately. The clock means send me a summary of uh, the notifications at the end of the day. And the calendar means send me a summary of notifications at the end of the week. And the X means don't send them at all. So we do recommend that for announcements created by you, you change that setting to be immediately. Similarly, the inbox tool also has this separation of messages that are sent to you and messages that you send out to others. And weirdly under the notifications, it is the inbox tool is referred to as conversations. So conversations really means the inbox tool. And the split here is conversation message. So that's receiving notifications when someone else emails you through the inbox tool. And then there's the conversations created by me, which again, the default is to not send that notification. So we recommend that you change that just by clicking on the little check mark there to make the check mark green. And then you will also receive copies of messages that you send out to your students through the inbox tool. Um, so really quickly, I do wanna go over the inbox tool just a little bit. The inbox tool is also located in your left side global, global navigation bar. And when you click on the inbox tool, it will take you to the inbox, which collects all your email messages from all of your courses. Well, all the inbox messages from all of your courses into one place. And this is really great because if you are teaching five, cl five classes this semester, you don't have to go into each of those classes to find your messages they're actually all just pulled together right here in one spot. You can filter this view up at the top on the left-hand side here is a little drop-down menu where you can filter your inbox to show just the messages for a particular course. And when you select that course, it will then just show you the messages for that particular course. You can, of course, keep switching in between different courses or if you wanna go back, you can click on all courses and it will give you everything all together at once. When you are ready to compose a message to your students, in the upper toolbar here, kind of towards the center, is a little icon which looks like a piece of paper with a pencil on it, and that's the compose button. And when you click on compose, it's gonna open up the little um, pop-up here to start composing your message. Um, this tool, I just um, also want to say this tool, the inbox tool is a two way communication tool. So you can create messages and send them out to your students and your students can reply back to these messages. So messages can go both ways through the inbox tool. So when you're composing up at the very top here, the first drop down, you will select what course you want to send a message to. So I'm just going to pick one of my sample courses. And then you'll get this little two bar. And at the very end is a little button for the address book for this course. And when you click on the address book, it will give you several options for who you want to send this message to. The topmost says send the message to absolutely everyone that's enrolled in the course. And then below that, it will list out the different roles that are associated with your course. So I have some teachers in my course or instructors and I have some students in my course. So I could decide I wanna send a message just to all the instructors in the course. If I had TAs, TA would also be listed here, or I could say I just wanna to send to all my students. If you wanna send it to a particular person, you can just click on one of these roles. So I know I wanna message one of my students. I can click on students, and then it will list out all the available students that I can send a message to. I can click all students and that would send all of the people that you see listed here, or I can click on a specific name to email just a particular person. You can keep adding. So if I knew I wanted to send a message to two or three people, I could go back through and select individual users and have multiple people receive my message. I will also mention that in this menu, you can see that there is an option for course sections. If you are teaching a course that has discussion sections and lab sections all rolled up into one Canvas site, you would be able to also click on course sections and select to send a message to a specific discussion section if you so desire. The compose message 
uh, tool here does create plain text messages only. So that's why you don't see any toolbars for putting in bold or italic or anything like that. This is intended to be a plain text message. So you would just type in here your message. There is also at the very bottom here, a couple of icons. You can attach a file to your message or you can also record an audio or video comment to include within the message. When you click send on this compose message window, it will then send a message to everyone listed on your toolbar. And if you set your notifications up to do so, you should receive a copy as well. So that is the inbox tool. Um, the other tool that is useful for communicating with your students is called the announcements tool. And that tool is found within your Canvas course site. So I'm gonna pop back over to my dashboard page and I'm going to open up my sample course. So now I'm inside of my sample course. So you can see my sample course here. And up towards the top of the list on my course navigation menu is the announcements tool. And you will notice immediately that right next to my announcements tool, there's a little icon that looks like an eye with a slash through it. And that means that students are not able to see this tool right now. And that might happen for one of two reasons. Um, either it's a tool that I've decided specifically to hide from students, which typically has that little indicator and will appear towards the bottom of your list. Or it might have this indicator because I just haven't put any content in there yet, which is the case for announcements. I haven't created one yet, so it's showing me that it's, it's empty, essentially. So to compose a message through announcements, you just click on announcements, and then you'll be brought to the announcements page. Now keep in mind that unlike the inbox tool, the announcements tool is actually a top-down messaging system that goes one way. So it's basically instructor level and TA level users sending messages down to students and students cannot and do not reply to announcements. So announcements is one way, whereas the inbox tool is two way. So when you're ready and you wanna compose a announce, an announcement message, you come to the announcements tool and click on plus announcement. And then you'll be brought to this little form here, which does have a toolbar for some formatting, so you can make it look a little bit prettier. Um, so you fill that in, you add in your information, you give it a title, and just below the editor where you type in the message of your announcement, there is a little post to section, which again can be used if you have a course that has discussion sections or lab sections. You can target an announcement to a specific section by clicking on the little drop down arrow here and picking a specific section. If you have selected the wrong section, you can just click on that little drop down again and pick something else. There is also a little bit of a hidden feature here called delay posting, which allows you the ability to create an announcement today that will appear at a future date. And to use this, you just click on the little checkbox to delay posting and then you will select using the little calendar icon, you will select the date on which you want this message to appear. And you can also insert time here as well. So you, you can see that that's down here. You can enter in your time as well. Keep in mind that if you use this tool, the email notification that goes out to students and if you have opted to do so, the message that would go to you as well, will not be sent until this date. So if I hit save on this today, I'm not going to get that notification yet. I would get that notification on March 17th because that's the date I've selected here. And that is the announcements tool. Um, a couple other things. Within your course navigation menu, there are two roster type tools. One is called the people tool and the other is called the photo roster tool. The people tool is the um, tool that is a native Canvas roster. So it comes with Canvas and it will list out all the users in your course and the role that they have in your course and the section that they're enrolled in. But what's really useful about this tool is if you need to add a TA or a support staff person, you can do that through this tool. Um, you just come into the people tool 
and click on plus people. And then it will bring up this menu here, this pop-up, where you can then add users to your course site. You can add users by their email address or their NetID. Just make sure you pick the correct one, depending on which one you're adding them by. You would enter in their email address or NetIDs here. And then you'll need to select the role that you're going to give them in your course. Um, I will mention that here you see guest instructor. A guest instructor has the same level of access as an instructor, uh, as a person with a, the instructor role. The distinguishing factor is, is that this person, the guest instructor, is being manually added to the course. That's really the only reason it says guest instructor and not instructor. And once you've added in people and selected the role that you want to give them, you can then hit next, 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 and add them to your course. So that is how you can add people. If you have any people that are from a different institution that you wanna to add to your course for say a guest lecture or something like that, they do need to have an account in Canvas. And if they don't already have that, you just need to request a guest account for them and then you would be able to add them to your site. The other roster tool that's in your course nav is the photo roster. And for those of you who've been using the photo roster, you will notice that it got a bit of a facelift this week. Um, so it looks a little bit different, um, but it still has all the same functionality that you had in the previous version of the photo roster. It still has all the sorting, the hiding names, searching, everything is still here that was there before. In this view, you're seeing I'm looking at the photo view and you can see here at the top the green indicator indicates which view I'm looking at. I'm looking at the photo view, but there is also the list view. And when you click on list, it will take you over to the tabular view of all of your students. The nice thing about this list view is it includes some additional information that is not available to you under the people tool. It includes the students email addresses. And it also includes their residential college, their major, and their graduation year. So you get a lot more information on this view um, through the photo roster. We strongly, strongly, strongly encourage you to come into the photo roster and into the list view and download the CSV version of this list view. And the reason for that is that if you download this, you will have a copy of all your students' email addresses. So if for some reason, maybe Duo isn't working for you and you're not able to authenticate into Canvas, you would still have all of the email addresses for your students so you could send them a message to let them know that you're having trouble logging in or that you need to do something else. Um, so it's always a good idea to just have a copy of those email addresses locally just in case you ever need to use them. And with that, I will turn it over to Brian who will start talking about Zoom. Great, thank you, Timberly. So um, just a couple items that I would like to go through before we, we get into how to enable Zoom in your Canvas course um, is how to just ensure that your Zoom account um, is set up and under Yale's license. Um, so Yale has a Zoom homepage, which is yale.zoom.us. And when you go to that homepage, you see you have the option to sign in. Signing in here will ensure if you don't have a Zoom account, that one is created for you using your Yale.edu address. And it also ensures that if you had created a Zoom account using your Yale.edu address, say a free account in the past, that that account is then successfully moved to Yale's license. Um, the, the Zoom integration in Canvas does require um, that your account be under Yale's licensing. So going to Yale.zoom.us and clicking sign in um, is just a very easy way to make sure that you're all set up. If you had set up um, an account uh, previously using your Yale.edu address, um, once you click sign in, you'll just be sent an email confirming that you want to um, confirming that that you want to move your account to to Yale's license. Um, but if you never set up an account, clicking on sign in and going through the CAS process, uh, once you're on your profile page here. That just means that you have successfully set up your account. The other page I would like to point out before getting into Canvas um, is zoom.us slash test. And this is a great site um, for you to go to 
and there's just a join button here. And when you click that, it'll launch a meeting where you can test your audio and video settings. So if you're ever using a different, different device or just want to make sure that your microphone and camera are set up the way that you'd like, zoom.us slash test uh, is a great place to go. It'll go through testing your microphone audio um, and your camera video. So that being said, we'll move over to integrating Zoom into Canvas. So the first thing you'd like to do um, is just navigate to the course that you'd like to enable Zoom in. Um, Zoom is not enabled by default in every course. Um, so we'll just have to go through a process of, of making sure it appears in our course navigation. So to do that, you'll see in your course navigation, um, down at the bottom, there's an option that says settings. So clicking on settings brings you to a page with a number of tabs across the top. And we'll just want to go to the navigation tab. In the navigation tab, you see two lists. The top list is the tools that are enabled within your course navigation, and the bottom list are tools that are disabled. So we'll look in the list of tools that are disabled. We'll see two entries for Zoom. Um, this is because certain users at Yale, um, particularly in the School of Medicine or the School of Nursing, are required to have HIPAA compliant Zoom accounts. Um, if you're unsure of which one you may have, um, it's totally fine to enable both tools. Um, so that's what we'll do now. So there's two ways to enable the tool. One is to click and drag to the top enabled toolbar. And the other is you see three dots next to the tool. When you click on that, you have the option to enable. So clicking on enable moves the tool up to the sort of active tools section. And then you can click and drag to determine where you would like it to appear in your course navigation. So once you've brought these up to the, the top enabled tools section, you'll just want to make sure you click save. Once you click save, you'll see the tools appear in your left hand course navigation. So I just want to quickly show um, what it looks like when you when you click on, uh, on the wrong integration. So I know that I don't have a HIPAA protected Zoom account. So when I click on Zoom HIPAA, it notifies me that my email address does not exist or belong to this account, which is totally fine. But when I click on Zoom, I'm brought to a page where I can start scheduling a new meeting. Um, one thing I wanna point out here before we get into scheduling a new meeting um, is that if you're scheduling con uh, meetings for, for a number of courses, or if you have co-instructors or TAs or TFs who are also scheduling meetings within this course, you'll see uh, maybe a list of more sessions than just you have scheduled. You can always check off this box next to show my course meetings only, and that'll filter this view to just see sessions that, that you have scheduled within this course view. Um, students will see all sessions um, that, that everyone has scheduled within this course. So it is important to note if you have TAs or TFs who are schedule, also scheduling sessions, say for specific sections, um, that they just title their, their meetings uh, appropriately for their section. And we'll get into how you can set that. So we see in the upper right hand corner, um, a schedule a new meeting button. When we click that, we're brought to the page where we can enter all the details for our session. So starting from the top, we see that the topic has automatically imported um, our course name. You can change this field, but we do recommend that you at least leave your course name um, present in this field. because um, That is because once you schedule this meeting, um, it will send a notification to your students through the inbox tool. And it'll also put it on their calendar within Canvas. So keeping the course title in there is just a good vis visual reminder for the students um, what session that entry in their calendar corresponds to. Um, you can enter an optional description. Um, and then we move down to, to setting the date and time for our session. So the calendar icon next to the date brings up a calendar where we can select the specific day if we're scheduling a one-off meeting. And then we can set a specific time. 
you can then set the duration of your meeting. And it's important to note that this duration is not going to prevent you from starting this meeting earlier or stop the meeting once this duration has, has been reached. Um, this just dictates how it appears on the calendar, but it's not, um, it's not going to kick you out of your meeting or prevent you from starting early. You may want to schedule all of your core sessions at once, um, in which case you can check off the box that says recurring meeting. Once that's checked off, we see a number of new options that have appeared. Um, and it's worth noting that once you set up a recurring meeting, your first when field becomes when that recurrence will begin. Um, and we also notice this bold text next to recurring meeting this automatically updates as you, as you make selections here, just to let you know what it is you will be scheduling. So we can see that the recurrence defaults to daily. So this will schedule a meeting every day, um, which is probably uh, not what you're looking for if you're scheduling, say, a course that happens every Tuesday and Thursday. So we could click daily and change this to weekly. And now we see recurrence weekly, and it's going to repeat every one week, which means it will just repeat the same days every week. And we can see that the bold text here has changed to say every week. But we can also select which days we would like this to occur on. So say Tuesday, Thursday, perhaps, and we could uncheck Sunday. And then we can select an end date. And we see this text has updated every week on Tuesday, Thursday until April 20th, 2020, which will be a total of nine occurrences. Moving along, the next field um, is not really applicable to scheduling course content, and it's the registration field. We want to leave this unchecked just to make sure students don't encounter any roadblocks to getting um, into your meetings. Next, we see an area for video. This is just setting the initial state of videos for both you, the host, and students, the participants, um, in your session. Both you and, and students have the ability to turn their video um, on and off once they're in the session. Um, but this just says, if you know you want your video to be on right away, you can say on. Um, and if you want to encourage students to turn their cameras on, you can also turn their video on. But if you'd like to have some time after you start the meeting before your camera goes on, you can leave your video off. Under audio, uh, both is checked by default here. Zoom allows you to connect um, to audio both from, from a computer using your microphone and speakers um, or a telephone. So we encourage you to leave this set to both just in case students are um, maybe somewhere where they don't have reliable internet or they don't have access to a smart device or a computer, um, and they may need to dial in to your meeting by, via telephone. Under meeting options, again, we see a, um, an option here we wanna leave unchecked, which is require meeting password. Um, we don't want students, uh, again, to, to encounter any roadblocks or join these sessions, so leaving that unchecked is advised. The next one is one that will be checked by default, which is enable join before host. Join before host um, when it's enabled it just means that students will be able to join your course session before you as the host join. Um, so leaving that checked is a good idea uh, to have students kind of join the session early if they uh, need to test their, their microphone or their camera, um, and they don't need to, to wait for you as the host to start the session before they join. Next, we see mute participants upon entry, and this is an audio counterpart to the video section. Um, if you want students to have their microphones muted by default when they join the session, um, you can check off mute participants upon entry. Again, they will have the ability to unmute themselves, um, but this will just set the initial state of their microphone. Um, waiting room is not really applicable in this situation, um, but that just creates a room that you have to let people into your, your actual meeting room from. Um, so we recommend leaving this un unchecked. One that we do recommend checking um, is record the meeting automatically. There may be a, a chance, um, especially if you have students who are in different time zones, um, that people may just not be able to join the session. 
Um, so it may be a good idea to, to record the meeting. Um, having recording the meeting automatically checked just means that when you as the host join the meeting, the meeting will begin recording automatically. You can both start the recording and stop the recording manually from in, inside the meeting, um, which we'll cover um, in just a little bit. But checking this, this off just ensures that the meeting starts recording without you needing to remember to hit the record button. There are two options for where you can record, um, either on your local computer or in the cloud. Um, we recommend, if possible, to record to your local computer. Um, and that just leaves a video file on your hard drive. Um, we recommend that because it's a good idea to, to upload these recordings um, to the media library section of your course. Um, that's because access to the video content that, that's put in the media library um, is permission to just students within your course. Um, when you record in the cloud, you'll be sent an email once that's finished processing on Zoom's cloud with a link to, to view the video. And we don't recommend that you share that link um, just because there is no permissioning on it. And due to possible FERPA concerns, um, we want uh, course recorded content to be put in the media library. Um, that being said, we recognize that it may not be possible for everyone to record onto their local computer, um, be it due to storage size concerns. If you do record into the cloud, um, you do have the ability to download that file and then you can upload it to the media library. Next, we see a field for alternative hosts. Um, and this could be if you have co-instructors um, or TAs in, who you'd like to help manage your session. Um, you can just enter their email addresses here. This does require that they have gone through the, the process of, of ensuring that they have a Yale created Zoom account by going to yale.zoom.us. Um, but you can just enter email addresses, comma separated here, um, if you'd like to add people as co-hosts for your session. You can, um, and we will cover, cover this once we get into managing a Zoom meeting, you can make people co-hosts from within a meeting, um, but this is if you just want to set it ahead of time and not have to worry about assigning someone as co-host once you're in the meeting. So we'll click save at the bottom. And we then see a page um, that just gives us all the summary of the meeting that we just scheduled. But we'll refresh the Zoom uh, tool here just by clicking on Zoom in the left-hand navigation again. And now we see the list of, of sessions that we've just scheduled in our course. And I do just wanna take uh, just a quick second to switch to student view here, just so you can see what, how this will appear to students. So I'm, in, I'm viewing this course as a student now. And when I click Zoom, I see that list of sessions um, and I just see the button that says join. Students are not required to have a Zoom account to join the sessions. Um, they, are, they do have access, uh, as does everybody at Yale, to creating a, a Zoom account. So they are certainly welcome to do so if they wanna use it as a tool for, for maybe scheduling meetings um, with any, uh, for each other. Um, in your class, but they can just come to the Zoom section here, click join, and it will launch Zoom. So I'll leave student view. You as the instructor, you'll see a button that says start, um, and it'll always say start next to the, the next upcoming meeting that you have scheduled in your course. So rather than, than start this meeting, I'm just going to, to jump over. I'm just going to share a different screen here. Um, just so we can get into a meeting I, I already have in progress so we can go through um, some Zoom controls. So bear with me for just a second. Great. So moving over here, um, I just have um, a Zoom session active. So, so you can imagine um, if you click that start button next, next to your course, it would launch Zoom. Um, and here I am um, in my active Zoom session. So what we're currently seeing is what Zoom calls speaker view. And how speaker view works is you see um, some people's video in these smaller tabs up, the top, up top and one person's video in a larger window. And so Zoom will automatically switch whose video you see uh, based on who it determines is talking. 
So right now it thinks the student Claire is talking. So it's focusing on her video. There is one, uh, another way to, to view um, your participants in your Zoom meeting and that's gallery view. So you see in the, in the upper right hand corner, um, gallery view, clicking on that, breaks it out so we see everybody in an equal sized window. So this could be useful if you're in a course, um, say with maybe 10 to 15 people, you can have everybody's video be equally sized. Um, so you can kind of see everybody's face, um, judge their reaction, see if anybody's looking particularly um, confused um, or if somebody is kind of motioning um, that they have a question as Timberly just did. Uh, so for the time being, we'll just switch back to speaker view. So now um, we're just going to cover um, pretty much all the tools along the bottom uh, toolbar in your Zoom meeting. The first being um, your microphone and video controls. So uh, you being in, in this session with us now, um, you may already be familiar with those. But just to quickly go over, this is where you can um, both mute and unmute yourself and start and stop your own video. You'll see these upward facing arrows uh, next to the microphone and camera icon. And that means that there's a menu here. So we'll click on the upward facing arrow next to the microphone. And we see we're given the options to select which device we'd like to use. So this is useful um, if Zoom doesn't automatically select the correct device for you. Say if you have um, the microphone on your laptop, but also a external headset, um, you can select which microphone you'd like to use here, and the same with speaker. Similarly, next to the camera icon, um, if we click on this upward facing arrow, we'd see a list of, of camera devices. Um, so if you have more than one camera on your computer or use an external webcam um, and Zoom didn't automatically choose the right one, you can change which camera you'd like to use here. So moving along, um, we'll get into the Manage Participants tab. When you click Manage Participants, that's going to open um, a menu that shows you the list of everybody in the meeting. Um, and then the first uh, important thing in, in, in this Manage Participants tab is at the bottom you see a Mute All and Unmute All button. Um, so these can be very powerful tools if you're trying to manage um, a Zoom session that has a large number of people in it. You'll see that by clicking Mute All, um, say if you're getting a lot of background noise from a specific user and they may not realize it, clicking Mute All brings up this dialog window. And it says current and new participants will be muted. And you can decide if you'd like to allow participants to be able to unmute themselves. Um, in the current session that, that we are in hosting this workshop, um, we have all participants muted um, and we've allowed to, to not allow the participants, um, you all, to, to be able to unmute yourselves just because we know we're taking questions via the chat and, and we you know, want to keep the session manageable. But if you're just looking to, to sort of stop any excess noise, you can just say continue here. And it says current and new participants will be muted. Similarly, you can unmute all. Um, this will just give people the, the ability back to unmute themselves. Um, it's not going to make anybody's uh, microphone active when they had it muted themselves. Um, but if you want to give people the permission to mute themselves. A couple other things we'd like to, to, to note. Um, when you hover over particular users in the Participants tab, um, you can again mute and unmute them if they have an, a microphone available. But we also see this More tab. So clicking on more, um, we'll see a number of options. Some important ones I'd like to point out here um, is this make co-host. Um, again, if you have a co-instructor or a TA or a TF um, and you didn't, when scheduling the meeting, assign them as a, as a host or if they've joined in and they don't, have, they don't have a created Zoom account but you still wanna make them a co-host, you can select uh, make co-host here and it will give them the ability to, um, to use the host controls as well. You can also find the, this, this menu. Um, we see people's video up top here. 
when I hover uh, over somebody's video, we again see the ability to unmute them. And we see these three dots. Clicking on the three dots, we get um, the similar options, unmute audio. We can also stop their video. We can directly chat with that person. Um, but two that I wanna point out here are the pin video and spotlight video. Pinning video will ensure that somebody is the primary video um, just for you. So one possible use case of this is if you wanted to pin your own video, um, if you were writing on a board perhaps, um, and you want to keep your video in the largest screen so you can kind of like make sure you can see um, what you're doing, you could pin yourself um, or you could pin another user. And you'll see in the upper left-hand corner of their video, you can choose to unpin. Somewhat similarly to pin video um, is spotlight video. What spotlight video does is it makes um, the person you choose to spotlight the active speaker for everybody in the meeting. So you can think of this as the equivalent of, of calling on somebody in class. Um, so this will both make them the active video for everybody in the meeting. And it'll also prompt that user to unmute themselves if they do have themselves muted. So it'll say they've been spotlighted and please unmute yourself. Um, and then they can you know, ask their question or, or contribute. And similarly to pin, we can see we can cancel the spotlight video. So if you're trying to manage, manage a course with a, with a large number of, of people in it, um, I just wanna go over um, a few more, a few more um, options here. So when we go to manage participants, and we see this mute all and unmute all button, um, what, what a participant in your meeting will see is a button that says raise hand. Um, and this will be slightly different on, on mobile apps, but it'll be in the end of the participants tab. And we can see here that Timberly has raised her hand, which has put an icon on her video here. And it's also put an icon um, next to her name in the participants tab. And I'm just gonna do, uh, you have the, you can lower somebody's hand. So I'll just lower her hand. And then if I hide the manage participants tab and Timberly raises her hand, we see that we're notified here that this, the student has raised their hand. Again, this uh, may point out that it's important for your students to put in their names here. So, so you know who, who is trying to get your attention. From that point, you could, um, you could spotlight that user and prompt them to, to unmute themselves, or you could unmute themselves manually. Um, before getting into sharing content into your course, I just wanna to briefly just talk about the chat option, um, which uh, a number of you are probably familiar with um, in this meeting, but opening the chat window, you have the ability to chat uh, with everybody in the session or with specific users. So we can see that Timberly has said to everyone, um, hello, if we wanna to respond to her, we can click on her name here. And we see that down here has indicated that we're talking to Timberly um, privately. If we wanna go back to chatting with everybody, we can select everyone in meeting. Great, so I imagine um, a lot of people will be interested in, in how you share non-video content into your, into your Zoom session. And that can be managed through the share screen um, tab at the bottom of your Zoom, Zoom meeting. So when we click on share screen, we're, we're uh, presented with a menu of items that we can share. Uh, so the first one will be your desktop. And sharing your desktop um, shares, uh, as it indica indicates, everything on your desktop. Um, so this may be useful if you um, tend to use a lot of different resources uh, when you teach. So maybe you wanna show a website and a PowerPoint and it, maybe a specific tool, a uh, digital tool that you use for your course. You could share your entire desktop. Um, the downside is that it will share everything that's on your desktop. So if you get um, pop-up text notifications or, or email previews, um, those will be shared as well. So if you do wanna share your desktop, we just encourage you to um, be familiar with muting notifications, 
um, putting your computer into a do not disturb mode, um, or just otherwise closing applications that may prompt you um, uh, visually. But we see below this, um, I have a little Microsoft PowerPoint preview window here. And this is because I have a PowerPoint presentation open. So selecting this, we'll just share this specific application. So if you know that you only use PowerPoint and you're in, you want to be, be assured that you're not going to unintentionally share anything else, um, you can select just a specific application. And then when you share that, it will just share, uh, in this case, PowerPoint. Before we, we share something, I just want to point out, um, if you are sharing any content that has audio, um, so if you're showing, playing audio clips or maybe video clips, you'll just want to make sure that share computer sound is checked off. When you check off share computer sound, that will just ensure that, that any audio that's playing through um, your device is also shared with, with other people in your meetings. So we'll click Microsoft PowerPoint here. And when I click share, we see that now, if I move my toolbar, now we see the video of people in the sessions um, just on the left-hand side here. And you have the ability, uh, just let me move a different menu here. You have the ability um, to see everybody in the meeting and you, can, you could scroll down if there was more people in the meeting. Um, you can show just the active speaker or you can minimize this and you just see a text representation of who's talking. But, so we see our PowerPoint presentation and we see this green box around it. So that's just visually indicating to us that the, only the content within this green box um, is what's being shared. So now we could run our PowerPoint presentation and we still see the users in the group. So you can still see your students, um, but they're gonna see full screen um, the PowerPoint presentation here. So now we'll say stop share. Back in the share screen menu, um, we see the option to share whiteboard. And what that does is it just opens up um, just a whiteboard and a toolbar. So you have the ability to, um, to draw. So if you needed to just, um, you know, demo something for your, for your students by drawing here. Um, you could also uh, type via text. Um, but as you see, this is a collaborative experience. Um, so other people um, in the meeting can also contribute to the whiteboard. Um, you can erase content, but under this clear button, you can also clear your drawings, uh, all drawings, or just viewer, other viewers' drawings. Um, and then next to clear, there's a save icon, which will just save whatever's on the whiteboard um, just as a PNG image file. So we'll stop share again. Um, moving down, we see the record option here. Um, so if you didn't set your session to record automatically, but you wanna record, um, you can just click record here. And again, you're prompted to record on this computer or record to the cloud. Um, the last, and, and this is a, a pretty, pretty useful and powerful tool within Zoom, the last thing um, that I'd like to talk about here is breakout rooms. And what breakout rooms does is it takes everybody in your meeting and puts them into um, sort of sub Zoom meetings. So this would be the equivalent of, you know, maybe asking your students to, to pair off and, and collaboratively work together, um, but virtually through Zoom. So we'll see when we click breakout rooms that we're given this dialogue box. And in this case, we have four participants in this meeting. So it's saying, do you wanna assign these four participants into two rooms? And down at the bottom it says, oh, that'll be two participants per room. But say we want everybody to go into their separate room for, um, which may not necessarily be uh, usable, but as we change the number of rooms here, we see that it's going to change how many participants per room we have. But we'll change this back to two, so we have two per room. And then we can either have Zoom automatically uh, sort of randomly assign people together, 
or we can choose manually um, who's going to be in which breakout room. So we'll leave this on automatically for now. And clicking Create Breakout Rooms here uh, doesn't start the breakout rooms, but it just gives you, shows you who's going to be in which breakout room. So say um, we want to move somebody to a different room. Um, we could move them to a specific room. Um, you can exchange with a specific student. Um, but we'll leave this as the default for now. So you'll see an option in the bottom right of the breakout rooms menu here to open all rooms. And it's just when you open all rooms that we can see all participants have been invited to join breakout rooms. And so users are notified um, that they've been invited to join a breakout room and they can click join um, and join in on the session. So we can see now that everybody has joined their breakout rooms. So for all intents and purposes, I'm alone in the main session. But we see next to breakout rooms here, a button that says join. So you can, um, as the host, pop into specific users' breakout rooms. Um, so if you, uh, you know, would have people pair off to discuss amongst themselves, but you wanted to sort of wander the virtual classroom um, and pop in on people, you can join here. But students also have the ability in a breakout room to ask for help. And as you can see, uh, Timberly, who's in breakout room one, has asked for help. And it prompts you to, to join the breakout room right from here. So we'll click join breakout room. And now it brings us into a sub room um, with these two users. So you could um, answer their question that they have to um, you know, provide input. Um, and then when you're all done, you'll see in the lower right hand corner, leave breakout room. So when we click leave breakout room, we're prompted to either cancel or return to the main session. Clicking return to the main session just takes us back to our main room. Um, back in the breakout rooms menu here, we see the option to close all rooms. So when you wanna bring everybody back into the main session, you can say close all rooms and you're notified all breakout rooms will close and it counts down from 60 seconds. Uh, when you're in a breakout room, you just get a notification saying um, that the, the host is closing the breakout rooms and you can join, um, join back into the main room earlier than the 60 seconds, but um, after the 60 seconds is over, everyone will be moved back into the main session. And so we can see that everyone's come back in early to the main session. Um, and then you can always go back if you want to, um, to put people back in groups um, or make adjustment to your, to your groups, you can do that. And then you can reopen the windows. So um, that's what we wanted to cover today. Um, and we just really wanna thank all of you for, for joining us. Um, again, we know that this is a, a stressful time, um, but we're really you know, here to help um, in any capacity that we can. Um, so we appreciate your attendance and um, we look forward to, to speaking with you in the future. So thank you all and uh, have a good afternoon.